So we're going to have a look at Ecclesiastes 9 and 10, which is, I think, Solomon originally, but then later Hezekiah, complaining about how pointless and stupid life is because it ends in an eternal grave. Well, it does end in, in the grave, but of course it doesn't have to be an eternal grave for us. And uh, this indirectly leads us to, in very powerful terms, the Lord Jesus. So let's, uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus to thank you for Jesus, to thank you that we are related to much better things than what we have in this life. We really pray that you'll open our eyes to Ecclesiastes again and that we might see there your spirit and that we might feel it and be filled with it ourselves and that we might have your perspective on this life and that we might not wallow in the effects of the curse on this world and that we might rise above and see that your son who had our nature also rose above we do pray father for his return and that above everything each of us here will live forever in your glorious kingdom and that we might rejoice in that life eternal as we live this life and we pray for his coming and yet as marcus said we pray also for the world for those in authority as we are asked to pray, that we, we do pray for them and that you will help all of us to, to be able to contribute to, to be a light in this world. And so we pray for Miriam and Phil with their plans to go to Vanuatu and, and the longer term planning that's already going on for that and for their friend June that they'll be able to baptize her very soon in, uh, in Brisbane. We bring before you, Father, Phil's request that, that we might know your son and that we might make him known and that we might know him within us and that he might live in our hearts by faith, which is, Father, really all we, we really want. Father, we, we pray that you'll be with those who are struggling with, with health issues, knowing, Father, that we are given all these things to prepare us for your kingdom. We pray that you'll be with John's friend, Kishori, who, who's sick. And we think of the sister Wendy with her chemo. We bring before you, Father, all those things and all the things in our lives, great and small, that are irritants in a way that, that you have placed there. We pray that we may see your hand in them all and that we might, we might rise up and realize that this is from you and that we may not be frustrated but that we might appreciate that this is your plan and your purpose for each of us. So, Father, open our eyes now. We are attentive. We have ears open. We want to hear you. And we pray, Father, as Dee said, that you will be with those who are seeking for asylum, wherever they are in the UK or whatever, and that you will help us to be able to reach out to them and to give them a life that is worth living beyond the vanity of this world. We pray all this, Father, knowing that you hear us anyway, but we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, Ecclesiastes 9 and 10. I'm not going to uh, get someone to read these. I'm just going to uh, go through them. So you remember what I've been saying so far, that Hezekiah lived a, a sort of a good life, and then he was terminally ill, and he said, I don't want to die. God said, okay, I'll give you 15 years. But the problem is that he got lifted up in pride, and he became wealthy very quickly. And he basically made a deal with Isaiah, God's prophet, and said, okay, I will just have 15 years of a peaceful life now for myself, and okay, Judah and the temple and my children, my descendants will go into captivity. Judah will be destroyed. The temple will be destroyed. They'll go into captivity. And yes, my, my line will come to an end. My children will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Uh, yeah, fine, as long as I get 15 years now. And of course, as the 15 years came to an end, he started to realize death isn't that great. Sorry, life isn't that great. and book of Ecclesiastes was, I think, clearly written by Solomon when he had turned away from faith and turned to idols and decided that death was final. 
And so Hezekiah, I suggest, rewrote that book. And bits and pieces of it are very relevant to Hezekiah, as we're going to see. And we're told that God left Hezekiah so that Hezekiah might know all that was in his own heart. So chapter 9, verse 1, for all this I laid to my heart, even to explore all this. So yes, this is the state of Hezekiah's heart written down. And he reckons that death is the final frontier, that you live once in this life and you die, and that is the end of it. And of course, at the end of Ecclesiastes, this divinely inspired editor comes in and says, no, every little work should be brought into judgment. And you've, you are responsible to God and death will not get you out of that responsibility because there will be a resurrection to judgment. We know when the Lord Jesus returns. Well, he says, verse one, the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. Well, he's just said towards the end of chapter eight, the previous chapter, that there's no real advantage of being righteous or wise or wicked or foolish because you all die the same death. And so I go with the Good News translation, the Good News Bible, which I'm not normally a fan of, but there are some places in Ecclesiastes where it is very good. And it says there, God controls the actions of wise and righteous people, even their love and their hate. So what he's saying is, look, there's this bigger hand of God that is operating, and it's all kind of of God anyway, whether you're righteous or not righteous. So there's predestination. It's all going to happen as it's going to happen, which is a sort of feeling we all get at times. And so that human behavior is not significant. But of course, at the end of Ecclesiastes, we're told, no, God is going to bring everything into judgment, big things and small things. Every moment counts, every minute counts, every thought, every word, every action. And then he says here, whether it is love or hatred, man doesn't know it. All is before them. Well, again, the Good News Bible, no one knows anything about what lies ahead. Because as far as he's concerned, death is the, the final barrier. You're not going to get out of that grave. Well, of course, God does know the future. And as Isaiah says, dialoguing back with Ecclesiastes, that many times in the book of Isaiah, God does declare the future and he declares the past. Well, there was no reason why Hezekiah should not have understood that Messiah was going to come, there would be a resurrection and there would be a judgment and the kingdom of God on earth. Because the people who had gone before him David, Abraham, Job, they all expressed a very clear understanding of that. So he was choosing not to believe that. So he says, verse 2, all things come alike to all. There's one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good, to the clean, to the unclean, to him who sacrifices, and to him who doesn't. Well, both Solomon and, he <coughs> and Hezekiah are noted for offering huge numbers of sacrifices, thousands of them. And now he says, that was all a waste of time, because whether you offer a load of sacrifices or whether you don't, there's one thing that happens to you, and that's death, and you're not getting out of that. Well, we know that this isn't the case, that life does matter. And when you think about there's no difference between the man who sacrifices and the man who doesn't, well, this is one of Hezekiah's many allusions back to early Genesis, because very often he, he laments that you're just laboring just in the sweat of your face, and that's your position, and you better just try and get through life cheerfully, but it's a pretty bad deal. Labor, 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 and it's all vain. Yeah, that was the curse, wasn't it? That in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you go back to the dust. So back in early Genesis, there was a man who sacrificed and a man who didn't sacrifice properly, and that's Cain and Abel. Abel offered a sacrifice, a good sacrifice involving the shedding of blood and was accepted. Cain offered an inferior sacrifice and was rejected. And of course, Hebrews 11 talks about that and says that Abel, because he offered a better sacrifice, is going to be saved and going to be in God's kingdom. But Cain will not be. And we're told that although Abel is dead, 
yet he still speaks because of what he did. Whereas, you know, Paul uh, Hezekiah is saying that it doesn't matter, you sacrifice or you don't sacrifice. And actually the word Abel, Abel in English, is from the same consonants as this word, this Hebrew word, Hebel, which is translated vanity, as if he's saying, yeah, that story of Cain and Abel, well, you know what, they both died, so it's all a waste of time. No, he's absolutely discounting any possibility of resurrection, any possibility of eternity and of eternal judgment, putting that right out of his mind. As, so he goes on, as is the good, so is the sinner. He who takes an oath is he who fears an oath. So he's saying that if you make an oath to God, well, same end, you still die like the guy who didn't. Now, of course, it was Hezekiah who had made an oath to God when he was cured of his terminal illness and was given 15 years. He said, oh, I make an oath. I promise you, God, I'm going to just walk really humbly now in my life. I'm going to be grateful to you. I'm going to be full of praise for you. But he didn't keep that oath up. But now he's saying, well, it doesn't make any difference anyway, because you're going to die, whether you make an oath to God or whether you don't. So it is also so tragic that a man who was once so aware of God and was saved by God from a terminal illness comes to this. And we have here a, a, a sort of a snapshot, a picture of the mind that has turned away from God. And as I said to you before, although at this moment we should be able to say that if the Lord comes now or I die now, I definitely will be in his kingdom. Well, yes, but we may fall away. And this would be the picture of our life and our mind if we did. It's very powerful stuff. Verse three, this is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one event to all. So he's saying, yeah, the one event is death. And that's evil. He sees death as this terrible evil. Well, you know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, yes, death is the last enemy. It is the ultimate enemy of man. Uh, but <laughs> the last enemy has been destroyed for us in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, which is what we're here to remember in, in the bread and wine. So is death an evil? Well, it's a, it's a necessary bridge. It's a necessary bridge for all of us, but it is not this huge evil that he, he wants, wants to look at it at. Then he says, the heart of the sons of men is full of evil and madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. It's like he says in chapter eight, because sentence against an evil work isn't executed quickly, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. So I think he's sort of blaming God. He's saying, well, yeah, because God doesn't get on and kill us straight away because we're whatever, sinners, well, that's why the heart of man is evil. And actually, man is crazy. No. Yeah, he, he's, I know all of us might have just had for a momentary uh, second those kind of thoughts, but the resurrection of the Lord Jesus opens up our resurrection. We are responsible to God. We will give an account. And no, this is not true. Life is not just madness and stupidity and it's God's fault that because we die, that's why we're all kind of crazy. No. Once you see the difference that resurrection makes, it's all the difference. Well, verse five, the living know that they will die. Well, if there was anybody who knew he was going to die, it was Hezekiah. because God said, right, I'll cure your terminal illness. Uh, but I'll give you 15 years and you're going to die at the end of the 15 years. So he knew pretty well exactly when he was going to die. It was very relevant. The living know they will die, but the dead don't know anything. Correct. Death is unconsciousness. There is no immortal soul. There is no wafting off to heaven to play a harp on a cloud when you're dead. It's all to do with the resurrection of the body when Jesus comes back and judgment and then eternal life. So yes, the dead don't know anything. Then he says, neither do they have any more a reward for their memory is forgotten. Uh, no. The fact death is unconsciousness does not mean you have no more reward. I come quickly, the Lord said, and my reward is with me to give every man as his work shall be. So the reward is going to come. Yes, it is not at the moment of death, but it will come. 
So it's like he's really laboring his rejection of any hope of resurrection. But as I said, he's he had the possibility to understand that. I mean, Job, who lived before him, said, even though after I'm dead, worms will eat my body, yet I know that in a bodily form, in my flesh, I will see God, whom my eye will see and not another. So he has this great hope of bodily resurrection. So Hezekiah is putting this out of his mind, just as you might meet people who once believed and tell you now that they don't believe, and you talk about judgment and resurrection, and they have clearly put that out of their mind. But we are realists, and we accept that we are going to be judged. Absolutely. And he says their love, their hatred, their six, their envy has perished long ago. So whether you were a loving person, a hateful person, somebody who was bitter and cranky, twisted with envy all your life, doesn't matter. Neither have they any more a portion forever at any point in anything done under the sun. So again, he's saying well, whether you love or whether you hate doesn't make any difference. Yes, it does. End of Ecclesiastes. All these things will be brought into judgment. It does matter whether you're twisted with envy, whether you're bitter with hatred, or whether you're full of love. It does matter. Now, he keeps on saying seven times, actually, in Ecclesiastes, that you should just enjoy your portion now, because this is the only portion that you've got. Later in this chapter, he will say, look, live with the wife that you love and have a fair life together because that's your portion in this life. So he says earlier, eat and drink because that's your portion. Yeah, you've got to labor. You're under the curse in Eden. You've got to labor, unfortunately, but try and get through this life as cheerfully as possible. As he said, uh, don't be too righteous. Don't be too wicked. Don't get in trouble both ways. Just, just, just enjoy yourself. Keep your head down. And try and be cheerful. As, as you slog through this totally pointless existence. Might as well try and be cheerful, they're not. Because as he says here, you have no portion forever in the future. This is all you got. But of course, no. Even the old covenant, uh, the law given through Moses, said that Israel had a portion in the land forever. This was actually part of the promises to Abraham that they would have a portion. And I think that every family of Israel was given a plot of land, a physical plot of land, and the intention was they would keep that forever unless they gave it away, traded it away. But of course, he's not in covenant relationship with God. All through Ecclesiastes, you never read the word Yahweh. Yeah, he just talks about God. He doesn't use the covenant name for God. So he says there is no more portion. There is a portion forever. He says you have no portion forever. Yes, you do. The portion of the kingdom. That's why David says Yahweh is my portion. Daniel, you will stand in your portion. You will stand in your lot at the end of the days. You're going to die now, Daniel. But don't worry. You'll be resurrected and you will have your portion in God's kingdom. So we each have a, a specific portion that is prepared for us in God's kingdom, a specific inheritance, as it's called elsewhere. We have that. Eternity is not just, oh, well, now I'm not going to die. I mean, it will be. Immortality is part of it. But we will each have a specific reward, a specific inheritance. You and me will do something specific and be something unique. We will be given a name. The Lord says that nobody knows apart from him and you. That is a totally intimate, unique portion, inheritance. And, you know, Hezekiah here says, oh, just get on and enjoy your life. That's your portion now because you, you're not going to have any portion in the future. Yes, we do. This is the hope of the kingdom, that we do have something specific. And so he says, go your way, verse 7, eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your work. So I think he's been sarcastic now. He's saying, look, get on and enjoy your life. Yeah, drink your wine. Don't worry, God will accept you. Or as the Good News Bible says, it's all right with God, because it's all right with God. In other words, he doesn't care. You're going to die. Actually, how you live doesn't really matter. 
Well, Paul keeps on in 1 Corinthians 15, that's a great chapter about resurrection, he keeps alluding to Ecclesiastes. And one of the things he, he alludes to is this verse, where he says that if there is no resurrection, we might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Well, he's quoting here from Ecclesiastes, or alluding here to Ecclesiastes 9 verse 7. So he's saying that, no, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and because I live, as he said, you shall live also, this changes everything. It is not a case of, we might as well just, you might as well drink a bit of wine and get, get drunk on a Friday night because that's all you got. No? Just enjoy yourself, mate. No. <laughs> yeah, if there was no resurrection and this life is all you've got, well, yeah, obviously so. Why not? No advice. But <laughs> Jesus has risen. Death is not the final frontier. And we will be resurrected and be judged. And again, I think he's alluding to the curse in Eden, because he says, eat your bread, but with a merry heart. Well, he's, we were told, Genesis, that because of Adam's sin, we shall eat bread in the sweat of our face, in labor. You will labor to eat your bread all your life, and then you will die. And he's saying... Well, yeah, that's how it is. So you might as well do it at least cheerfully and drink a bit of wine while you're at it, while you're eating your bread. No. You see, Genesis 3 goes on to say that there will be a seed of the woman, of Eve, who is going to destroy the seed of the serpent. And eventually, the curse in the Garden of Eden is going to be taken away. That's why end of Revelation, you get the picture of the Garden of Eden restored in the kingdom of God on earth. So he's wallowing in the curse. And I said before that, look at the lyrics of a lot of music, artistry actually in, in all its forms. So much of it is wallowing in a fallen world just wallowing in it. And that is what people are beating in their heads all the time, that we're just wallowing in this fallen world. Yes, it is fallen, absolutely. And yes, we do eat bread in the sweat of our face until we die, and then we turn to the dust, absolutely. But for us, there is the hope of resurrection. There is a huge light at the end of the tunnel. We just keep exploring the tunnel and, and lamenting how dark it is, there is a light at the end of it. But he doesn't have that. He says, verse 8, let your garments be always white and don't let your head lack oil. Well, white garments and oil is what you wore to a wedding or to a party. So I think he's saying, look, always be like that. You might as well party every day as far as you can. And again, verse 9, live joyfully with a wife whom you love, for that is your portion in life and in your labor. No. We, we have the eternal portion ahead. He said that, that you will have no more portion in the future, so you might as well just get on with your portion now. And this, of course, is how secular man reasons. He has to. Well, how else can he reason? But what we're here to remember is the Lord's resurrection and the life eternal that is in him. Verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. But there's no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol, the grave, where you are going. So he's saying wisdom is only useful for this life. It's tragic, really, to think like that, but that's what he's saying. And he's going to go on to say, well, for example, if you're cutting wood with an axe and the axe head is blunt, you know what, son? Wisdom is profitable to direct, sharpen the axe, and it will actually demand a bit, a bit less labor from you. But there's no wisdom after, after this life. So it's all, this is helpful for now, but that's it. And whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, because you've only, you only pass through life once. Um, no. I keep saying that Isaiah's later prophecies are in dialogue back with Hezekiah. Don't forget Isaiah was alive, right into the reign of Manasseh, Hezekiah's son. And according to tradition, it was... Hezekiah's son Manasseh, who killed Isaiah and sawed his body in two. Well, Isaiah 65, verse 22, 
Isaiah talks about the kingdom, and he says that God's people will long, that is, eternally enjoy the work of their hands. They will eternally enjoy the work of their hands. Well, Hezekiah says here, no, the work of your hands is just for this life. You didn't go beyond the grave. No, Isaiah says, God's people in his kingdom will eternally enjoy the work of their hands. What that means is that what you do in this life for God will have an eternal inheritance, will have an eternal effect, which you will eternally enjoy. And that's why Paul, when he's writing the Philippians, says, if you guys are in the kingdom of God because of the effort I made for you, you will be my eternal joy. So what you do for God, you will eternally enjoy. Now, I've, you know, I've, some of you know that I, I'm in the middle of a crazy trip around Germany, driving, driving, driving to baptize people. And I'm not making myself out to be pious or particularly whatever. You know, for, for the years I've been in Christ, I, I should far more have the mind of the Lord than, than I do. And I, I, I'm disappointed in myself. So I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that I'm so righteous. But what I'm saying is this. I'm here for a couple of days. Right? Drive, 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 drive. Huge numbers of kilometers. Make this guy, baptize him onto the next one. And at the end of these trips, I fly back to wherever I'm going. But when we lived in Riga, back to Riga. Now I go back to London. And, and you, you know, you overhear conversations. People have been away for the weekend. Oh, you know, we had this pizza. Wasn't the pizza great last night? And oh, wasn't that castle so pretty? Wasn't this great? Oh, we had this great time. Oh, now we got to go back to work. And you think, Perth? Pathetic. But I did drive and drive and drive and <clears throat> baptize on those folks. I hope that they're going to live eternally in God's kingdom. I don't see why they shouldn't. Right? I will eternally enjoy that forever. No, I'm not making myself to be so righteous, but I'm telling you that this is the way to live. And if you're simply enjoying this life, in between the uh, you know, the commas, enjoy uh, this life, and it's not all that great, quite honestly. If all you can do is enjoy pizza, which is you know a bit of flour beaten flat and with some stuff on it that tickles your taste buds, and if that's all you can write about on Facebook, and if that is all you can infuse about to your friends, or well, poor you, what an empty, sad person you are! What a sad person! Get a life. You know what, mate? You can get a life. Give your life to Jesus and you can live a different life. You will long eternally enjoy the work of your hands. You won't enjoy the work of your, of, of your holiday weekend in Germany for eternity. You might enjoy it for a bit now, uh, but you won't enjoy it eternally. What you do for people, for God, in the spirit of the Lord Jesus, you will enjoy that forever. Now we are forming the nature of how we will eternally live. You see, this is the what comes out of Ecclesiastes, that every hour, every decision, every action counts. You know, the author, whatever you want, Solomon Hezekiah is saying, nah, hey, just for this life, yeah, 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 do it for this life, but that's the end. No. Isaiah reasons back with him and says, no, you will, God's people will eternally enjoy the work of their hands. Whereas he says here, no, Sheol, the grave, is the valley. That's, that's the finish of it. No. The night comes, the Lord said, when no man can work. And he actually said that in the context of going uh, to uh, resurrect Lazarus. Again, the context of doing something for other people. Basically it's saying, let's walk through the night to, to get there. Uh, let's, let's walk in the daytime, sorry. Uh, all, all day and forced to march so that we can get there because the night comes and no man can work. And that is how it is. Now is the opportunity. You know, Job says, my days sprint past me like runners. I will never see them again. So yes, there's a wonderful significance to life. This is where yeah, so much depression arises from, this sense that life is pointless. 
that every hour and every day is just the same and it's all just a ride on the gravy train. Yeah, it is. Until you see that you can do something more than that. And he says, <clears throat> verse 11, I saw that the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise. So if you're wise, doesn't mean that you, you get your bread easier. Nor yet riches to men of understanding, but time and chance happen to them all. So I think he's saying that random good luck and bad luck overarch all this stuff about wisdom and righteousness. And so he says wisdom and righteousness are of no ultimate value. For one thing, they all end in the grave. And secondly, time and chance, random event, luck or bad luck, just well takes, takes over. That's a big factor in the whole thing, whether you're wise, righteous or otherwise. So he's totally devaluing any kind of moral choice, obedience or spirituality. And if that's the way you look at life, well, no wonder this world is full of people with mental health issues. No wonder this world is full of people with depression. Yeah, sure. Because you can work very, very hard and then, well, yeah, there's a, a fire or an earthquake and your lovely house falls down. Or, oh, hang, I, my insurance policy wasn't valid. Oh, no, I've lost it. Hmm. Yeah, time and chance happens. You can kick around all day doing nothing much, and it happens that the bloke next door to you is a very wealthy guy, and oh, he's just died and left you all his wealth. So there you are. You were lucky, weren't you? No, absolutely not. <laughs> this is the this is the, the the tragedy of the whole thing. Right, verse fourteen. I, I said that parts of Ecclesiastes are clearly relevant to Hezekiah, not Solomon, and this is an example. There was a little city and few men within it, and a great king came against it, besieged it, and built great bulwarks against it. This is Jerusalem at the time of Hezekiah, when it's surrounded by the Assyrians at the time that. He was terminally ill, and then one angel of God went out and killed 185,000 Assyrians. We're told twice in Isaiah that there were very few men left within Jerusalem. So the city is Jerusalem. There were few men left in Jerusalem, and a great king. Well, hear the voice of the great king, the king of Assyria. Sennacherib said out, uh, Rabshaki said outside the walls of Jerusalem. And he came with a great host, a great army, and he besieged Jerusalem and he built siege engines against it. We are told that. The inscriptions of it, the depictions of it are on Sennacherib's prison. So, yeah, this is very much not Solomon. There's nothing like this in his life. This is Hezekiah. When the city was surrounded, and it was Isaiah, the prophet, who was faithful to God, who basically was their salvation. So verse 15, now a poor wise man was found in it. This is Isaiah. And he, by his wisdom, delivered the city, but no one remembered or respected that same poor man. Yes. And he says, verse 16, nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. Well, the Good News Bible says no one thinks of the poor as wise or pays any attention to what they now say. Yeah, well, this is what happened. Isaiah saved the city, and then he says to Hezekiah, look, you have got lifted up in pride. Why did you show all your wealth to the ambassadors from Babylon? And basically, says to Hezekiah, you you need to repent. You can have 15 years of peace and everything's going to be taken into captivity at the end of it, or you can repent. And Hezekiah basically says, okay, if that's a deal, I'll take the 15 years. That's good. I get 15 years. So he no longer respected uh, the prophet Isaiah, this poor man whose words were now not heard in the future. And indeed, it seems Isaiah was persecuted by Hezekiah at the end of Hezekiah's life, and Manasseh, his son, killed him. So what you get from that is that Hezekiah has got this very high level of self-analysis. He understands exactly 
what's the matter with him and what he's doing. Like he says, the worst thing is an old, old king who will not listen to admonition. Yeah, that's you, Hezekiah or Solomon, all the same. The old king who will not listen to wisdom any longer. So you see, you can understand yourself like the alcoholic can understand themselves perfectly, can understand the biochemistry of addiction and, and the chemical bondings that are going on in their biochemistry. Yes, I'll carry on doing it. Uh, and so, yeah, we are asked to examine ourselves in a way that elicits change. Not just understand yourself, but understand and change. And it is the cross of Christ that does this, that elicits this. That is why we are told uh, that we must examine ourselves and so let a man eat of that bread and drink of that cup. But to stand in your own mind in front of Jesus crucified elicits something from you. You cannot be passive there. You naturally know yourself and you are changed thereby. And again, yeah, he says in verse 18, one sinner destroys much good. Um, yeah, or I think the Hebrew could imply when, um, well, it, Rashid, one of the big Jewish rabbis, he, he paraphrases this, when a wise man becomes a sinner, <clears throat> much evil is done. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, again, Hezekiah, you are understanding yourself, aren't you? that because you turned away, uh, therefore a lot of suffering was going to come upon Judah and you were good with that. You understand that? You didn't do anything about it, do you? Um, <clears throat> so one sin or one sinner destroys much good, like he says, beginning of chapter 10, a little folly destroys much wisdom. And yeah, again, he's got his mind back in the Garden of Eden, as Paul says, by one man, Adam, sin entered the world and so death passed upon all men so yeah he gets it all you can see all the theory but you've got to translate that theory into practice and this is the trouble if you're simply teaching and preaching academic bullet points of truth that you must understand the bible this way and that way and that way and then you must get baptized well you see all that truth of itself will not save you it will not save you of itself in the same way as it didn't save Hezekiah. So he analyzes himself so well. He really does analyze himself so well, but does nothing about it. He says again, verse five, there's an evil I've seen under the sun, error that proceeds from the ruler. Yeah, that's you. Because you, Hezekiah, turned away, therefore Judah, we're going to go into captivity. And you said, oh, fair enough. If I get 15 years of peaceful life, oh, fair enough, I'll take the deal. And yeah, he, he, he sees it, but he will not do anything about it. And then he, in, in verse 10, as I've several times mentioned, if the axe is blunt and you don't sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But skill brings success or wisdom is profitable to direct. So what he's really, what he's really saying here is, yeah, wisdom is there, but it is only sort of helpful for this life and beyond that. No. All of those to that. And he says, if only we, if we, if we only have hope in Christ in this life, we are of all men most miserable. And that's it. You can get this in nominal Christianity, where people will call themselves Christian and will have some knowledge of the Bible and of God's ways. And yet, when you ask them the point blank question, so when you die uh, and you come to judgment, what do you think the outcome is? So I don't have a clue, no idea. You haven't got a clue? Well, what is the good news then? What's your hope? I don't know. Well, I've had these conversations with people. I don't know. And in the end, as Paul says, if you only have got hope in Christ in this life, if your so-called Christian principles are just a nominal thing whereby you identify as a Christian in a cultural sort of traditional sort of way, 
you are miserable because you're halfway there, but not fully there. You are miserable. And this is why Paul is saying, look, don't be miserable any longer. Christ has risen because he lives, you will live also. You will come to the day of judgment, but his life, if it lives in you now, means that you will live forever in his kingdom. But no, he didn't, Hezekiah didn't want this. You see, verse 11, if the snake bites before it's charmed, there's no profit in the charmer's tongue. <clears throat> so he's saying that, right, there's a snake charmer and there's a snake. But suddenly the snake bites him and cures him before he had a chance to come out with his charm. And that's what he's saying wisdom is like. You're bitten by the snake. You're going to die because we're all going to die. <clears throat> so no matter what sweet, wise, clever words you might have got in your head, they didn't save anyone. And yes and no, you will not be saved by your technical academic knowledge that you've got in your head. <clears throat> this is not going to save you. And yet you see communities dividing over this issue or that issue or, or, or whatever, that we must uphold absolute academic truth on every tiny little bit of interpretation because it's so important. This is life eternal. Well, <clears throat> it is not any of it life eternal unless you see the simple basic truth of, of, of the Lord Jesus, basically, of, of his life, of his resurrection, of salvation, by, by absolute grace. <clears throat> it says in verse 14, a fool multiplies words. Man doesn't know what will be. What will be after him, who can tell him? Who can tell him what's going to come after him? Yeah. God. God through the Lord Jesus. And he keeps on saying this. Who can bring a man out of the grave? Who can do this? Who can do that? Oh, yes. God can. And this is the huge force it's all leading up to the end of the book where the inspired editor of this book says listen god will bring every work into judgment small great good bad absolutely so hezekiah had traded eternity basically for 15 years of peaceful existence now but as time went on he got to the end of those 15 years he realized how pointless that was. And he says in verse 16, woe to you land when your king is a servant and princes eat in the morning. Well, the Septuagint on the Good News Bible say, woe to, woe to you, O city, when you have a king who is young and princes <clears throat> who feast in the morning. So he's got in mind that the next king after him is going to be young. Yes, Hezekiah. When he was terminally ill, he complained to God, I don't have any male children. Okay, God said, I'll give you 15 years. Yeah, and he had Manasseh, who was one of Judah's worst kings. He killed Isaiah. And Manasseh was 12 when, when Hezekiah died. And now he realizes that, oh, this boy of mine, oh, I don't think he's going the right way. Yeah, he's a, he's a waster. He's going to have a feast for breakfast. Um, and he's going to be a young guy. And that's what the Good News Bible says. Um, <clears throat> Woe to you, O city, whose king is young. So he realizes that this choice that he's made is not that great. And this, I'm afraid, is how it is. If you choose the way of the world, you may talk it up as cool. As smart, and we did this, and we did that, and we had this wonderful life. But you know in your heart that that's fake. You know in your heart that there is a huge void. There is a huge emptiness in you. And as you get older, you will see that more and more clearly. There is only one logical path, and that is to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, his death for me, his resurrection, to believe that because, as he said, because I live, you will live also. And to realize that, yes, I will come to judgment. I am responsible. 
And every moment, every aspect of life, every decision, whatever, is lived before God. And I can long eternally enjoy the work of my hands. I can enjoy it forever and ever, if it is done for him. As I say, if you spend your weekends just I don't know, living it up and enjoying your expensive meals and the rest of it, how people live, isn't it? Yeah. Work hard all week and blow it at the weekend. And repeat, and repeat, and repeat until you die. Or until you can no longer enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Pathetic. And yet it's glorified as, as cool. You know. How cool? How cool is that? Huh? There's another way to do life. And as I say, it, beyond nominal belief, beyond nominal Christianity, beyond just signing up for a few ideas, beyond all this, there is the life of the Spirit. Now, of course, we're here to remember the Lord Jesus. And in him, of course, you see this absolutely to the end. That here was someone who looked, as Isaiah again says, would look back on the labor of his soul and be satisfied. And the, the greatest labor of his soul, the travail of his soul, as King James says, was his crucifixion. But there, naked, covered in blood and spittle, rejected by your friends, your best mates have left you on a way, uh, saved their own skins and left you alone, and slain by your own people. When you were their king, yeah, when nobody else understood you apart from God, and you even feel, my God, why have, how have you forsaken me? Yeah. He shall look, he does look, as he looks at you and me here as we break bread, looks into our hearts. He sees the labor of his soul and is satisfied. And in a much smaller way, if you live your life in, in radical service to him, you'll do the same. You look back in the kingdom and you will see, we will see, I will see, you will see. The travail, the labor of our soul. And as Paul says, again alluding to Ecclesiastes, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If it's labor outside of the Lord, yeah, it's, uh, Ecclesiastes kicks in. Oh, yeah, true, yeah, in vain, stupid, pointless. Yeah, just cheerfully get through it all and that's the end of it. No. But your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Praise him. So, going to take the bread and wine now, a cup in memory of the Lord. And Mark's, uh, Mark's going to take over to, uh, to do that. Uh. So, yes, here we come now to uh, remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus that has, that has captured each one of us into these wonderful, this wonderful life uh, in Christ and in God that uh, brings us into fellowship with God. So uh, we'll just give thanks now for the bread. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, when we come to take this bread, we see that sacrifice does matter. Uh, we've just been reading how the pen of the person who wrote Ecclesiastes said that sacrifice didn't matter. Ah, but God, this sacrifice does matter. It has changed the course of so many lives. It has set <clears throat> and concreted those covenants that you made to the fathers of old. And we have been trapped, thankfully, by this sacrifice. We know that also the sacrifices of each one of us that are in Christ actually do matter. And we thank you for bringing us into this life by our Lord Jesus, who we remember now as we have this bread. Amen. So we just share this bread in memory of our Lord Jesus. wonder if uh, 
either Marcus or Phil is up to do the um, thanks for the wine. Either one of you, please. Yeah, okay. Let's give thanks for the uh, the wine. Father in heaven, we thank you that you've revealed to us that this life need not be just one long vanity because you have called us that you've given us a purpose in life. And we've been reminded that if we however weak, try and live the way you want us to, then none of our efforts will be in vain, but you will be pleased and you will use them. And we thank you that we can look to the Lord Jesus, who had that mind and your spirit, and he knew that his life was not in vain. And we thank you that he can even now look, as it were, down upon us. And all over this planet where people are remembering him in the way appointed and trying to live their lives according to his example. And that he is pleased. He is pleased with what we're doing and the fact that his life was not spent in vain, but was spent in glory to you. And so we thank you for his sacrifice and we share this wine now, symbolizing his shed blood. And we give you great thanks in his name. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's draw our our little meeting to a close uh, with a prayer. Is uh, anyone in particular would like to close with prayer for us, please? Maybe. Yep. John. Yes. Um, uh, dear Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for this chance to uh, uh, be together and to worship the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and to to celebrate his death and uh, resurrection and please uh, be with us as uh, we follow his word and try to live in his name and to help others also do the same worldwide. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen. Thanks, John.